for class to start. Uh, if you don't have one of the books, please raise your hand and one will get passed to you. Gene would be so happy to pass you one. We're going to be on page seven in our yellow lesson books, or specifically in the outline I sent out and, uh, and the email. Last night, it's lesson five in this series of 13 lessons. Rapture and Armageddon. Well, it's 9.30, and so for all those on our live stream, we welcome you. Those who are visiting us, Marilyn, we welcome you as well. We've got a good group here this morning for this study. I got a special story to introduce our lesson in a few moments. So let us begin class with prayer, and so I invite you all to pray with me. <coughs> Dear God, we come to you in prayer, we thank you for being our God. We are so profoundly thankful for all that you do for us. We're thankful that you are in control and that you watch over us. Father, we pray for your blessings be upon this nation, our state, our community. Pray for the leaders of each. We pray, Father, for peace. We pray for decisions that will, will follow your will and be close to the teachings of your word. Father, there's so many that reject you and reject your word we pray that we will always stand true and have the courage to say what needs to be said and to stand for what needs to be st stood for concerning your word and your teachings father you are always right your word is truth we pray father that we will be dedicated to it father i Thankful for each one that has assembled here this morning for this class and for our worship service to follow later. Be with us, Father, in this study. Bless this church family. We place ourselves in your hands. We do pray, Father, that you forgive us of our sins and help us be forgiving of others. And Father, we want to thank you for the forecast of rain that we receive. We pray for a good measure of moisture today and in coming days to refresh this earth. Father, we pray for your blessings be upon uh, the many parts of our nation because there's a great deal of our nation that's uh, truly dry. Father, we now pray that our time spent in this study be pleasing your sight. And we pray these things, Father, through your Son, our great Savior, Jesus. Amen. So, Beverly and I married in March of 1974. And for a few years, I served as the associate minister for the Broadway was at the broad started out as the Broadway Church, and then became the University Church in Can no, it was the Central Church of Christ in Canyon, Texas, and then we built a new building while we were there, and uh, and it became the University Church in uh, Canyon, Texas. After a time, there was an opportunity for me to move to uh, Wilberton, Oklahoma because there was a small junior college in Wilberton and the church there in Wilberton had an active Bible chair uh, next to the campus and they were looking for a Bible chair director and uh, I became the new Bible chair director of the Wilberton Bible chair and 
for a year. And, uh, and it was great fun. I taught college credit classes on campus. The reason was one of the elders was the president of the college. <laughs> and uh, the other elder was the head of his department on the college. So we had an in. And anyway, I was in the social, uh, uh, sociology department or something such as that. And so I taught the life of Christ and then I taught uh, the uh, letters of Paul was uh, two of the classes I taught. And I had this gentleman who was very religious of a particular religious group. He was an older man. Of course, I was a young kid, so they, everyone was older than me except for the college students. And I had a good sized class. And so he took my Life of Christ class. And then he was taking my uh, uh, the Writings of Paul class the next semester. And he always called me Brother Bill. Every time he'd raise his hand, I'd call him and say, Brother Bill! And he'd have, he had great class, uh, questions and comments. And so I always looked forward to him contributing to the class. Right near the beginning of the class with Paul, on the writings of Paul, he raised his hand and said, yes. He said, Brother Bill, you know, we took, I took that first class with you uh, on the life of Christ, now in this class, and we haven't, you haven't said a thing, or nor have we studied anything about the rapture. When are we going to discuss the rapture in your classes? I said, well, the reason we haven't said anything about the rapture is I can't find it in the Bible. He said, Brother Bill, what do you mean it's not in the Bible? Sure it's in the Bible. I said, wait, wait, I just want you to know I am prepared for this, my class lesson for today. I'm really not prepared to discuss the rapture, but I'll tell you what, next class, I will be, pair, be prepared to discuss the rapture. I said, I want you to go in the Bible and you find everything you can in the Bible about the rapture and I'll make preparation for my part and then we'll discuss it and I'll give you the opportunity to share with the class what you find in the Bible about the rapture. Next class time. I took class row, and that's as far as I got. He raised his head, Brother Bill, there's nothing in the Bible about the rapture. Where do they get that stuff? I said, I'm glad you asked. Here's a handout, and off we went. And so we spent a portion of that one class on the rapture, me dealing with that. And folks, this lesson is a very basic lesson about the rapture and just touches upon Armageddon. And we're going to look at some things, and, uh, and I really need to, uh, as I always forget, get to our lesson. There you see, right now we've got again, part one. And so, the very first question. Does the word rapture appear in scriptures? I'll give you the answer. No. In fact, this lesson is rather simplistic because it asks a bunch of no questions right at the start. Now, for those of you on our live stream, for everyone in this class, I've got all kinds of information on the rapture. I've got a file on it in my office. I can uh, discuss this material to some length, but here's my problem with getting, with spending a great deal of time on it, much more than what we find in a simple lesson here of our study today. There are some of these religious world errors. They're very profound. There's a lot of detail about them. There's a lot of information. 
uh, that they put out where they take passages of scripture and misuse them and take them out of context. They'll go through the Old and New Testaments and they'll create this timeline by plugging all, all of these pet Bible verses together and each individual will plug their Bible verses in a different order. And so all these charts that they create will have a little different nuance to them. And so my problem is, and I'm just telling you, I'm just confessing here, I just consider my time more valuable than to become an expert on a religious error. I just feel like I can better spend my time. I've got the notes, and that's good enough for me. And so if you want more than what we deal with today and maybe in the next lesson on this subject, I can provide more information for you. So I want you to know I'm not trying to run through this. I'm not trying to short you. It's just there's a certain amount of information out there that I feel is worth our time to look at. Beyond that, it gets real old to me. Uh, emphasizing again and again that verse is out of context, that verse is out of context, and that verse is out of context. So, I thought I would run through this Let's see, near future on, here's a premillennial timeline. And uh, here is a premillennial, and they always have the millennial in there. They throw in the battle of Armageddon. We got the tribulation of the saints. Old Testament believers are raised. And, uh, and then we've got thrown in here the uh, judgments of the world, and then he turned to finally starting. Tribulation of seven years, the reign of the Antichrist, the seventh week of Daniel 7. And, uh, and so that's, oh, by the way, there is a rapture there. Christ descends, and, uh, and uh, he's going to establish his reign. That's one chart, and there's, here's another chart. This is saying we got creation, mosaic, church age, and then we got the Antichrist, 35 years of great tribulation, 35 years, the secret coming of Christ, and the rapture, and, uh, and then the kingdom age, a thousand years, Christ is reigning there, and then we have the resurrection of the wicked, and then we're going to start eternity. Now, you can't see that, and I understand that, but I just threw that in there because there are some of these charts can really get profound and quite crowded. But I want you to know the rapture is in here, and the tribulation, and the thousand-year reign, it's all in there. What I thought was interesting was a good brother thought he'd do his own chart. Timeline said to come to the end of world chronology. And his chart is correct. And in fact, it's quite good. He's got uh, uh, faith and repentance, confession and baptism down there in this part. And he's got the second coming and boom, the uh, judgment. And anyway, that's a pretty good little chart. You might make a note at www.bible.co. And... Uh, you might find some other good material there at that Bible website. So there are other charts out there. So with all these charts, uh, some of the things that are in various premillennial timelines is the near future, the invisible second coming of Christ, the rapture and the first resurrection occurs. All true Christians have suddenly vanished from the world. And Christ takes his church to heaven for seven years. And the clock of prophecy starts ticking again. We have Daniel's 70th week begins, a seven-year countdown. The Roman Empire rev revised as 10 United States of Europe. A Roman dictator 
uh, the signs of peace treaty with Israel. All the nations come under Roman rule. The Jews repossess Jerusalem. The Muslim Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem is removed. The temple is built on that historic site. Israel grows extremely rich. 144,000 are chosen to preach. There's a spiritual rebirth of Israel. Total conversion of all Jews. The world temporarily under the Roman peace. Then there's a tribulation. This is the middle of Daniel's 70th week. Uh, three and a half years or less. By the way, they love taking the phenomenal, wonderful vision of Daniel and abusing it and misusing it and plugging it in various parts here. Uh, and during the tribulation, the Roman dictator, the Antichrist, proclaims himself God. The Antichrist desecrates the temple. A new and false world religion is established, the mystery of Babylon. The Antichrist persecutes the Jews. 144,000 become martyrs. There's a great tribulation, extreme wrath, a world unrest, and upheaval. The king of the south, that's the Egypt, Africa, and the Arab bloc, attacks Israel. The king of the north, Russia, invades Israel and destroys the king of the south. The king of the west, which is Europe, attacks and destroys the king of the north. The king of the east, which is China, attacks the king of the west with 200 million soldiers. Then you have the millennial. The battle of Armageddon threatens to annihilate the world. There's a visible second coming of Christ. Remember, the other one was invisible. The uh, church, saints, return with Jesus in an immortal glorified bodies and Jesus sets foot on the Mount of Olives. Daniel's 70th week comes to an end. Seven years have elapsed. The Antichrist is destroyed. Tribulation martyrs are raised immortal with glorified bodies. Old Testament saints are raised immortal with glorified bodies. Christ sits on David's throne in Jerusalem. Sheep and goats judgment of Matthew 25 occurs. The good sheep now have position or positions of authority. The wicked goats are the subject of a rod of iron rule. Uh, the supposed Enonic curse on the ground is lifted. The curse of Babel on language is lifted. It becomes one world tongue. Animals are now at peace and have the gift of simple speech. Satan is bound for a thousand years, the millennial time. Temple worship is restored. Mosaic laws enforce again. Constant pilgrimage to Jerusalem from afar. A millennial of peace and prosperity under Christ. After the millennial ends, Satan is loosed from his prison. Nations are deceived. There's a season of rebellion. The battle of, of Gog and Magog occurs. The resurrection of the wicked. The last judgment. The wicked are cast in the hellfire and new heavens and new earth created. That's just one timeline of one sample. My other handout has a long list of uh, Bible verses that are abused. And, uh, so anyway, I could give you a lot more. And I, at some point, I just feel like, why am I wasting my brain power on these false ideas? And since there's such a variety as they pick and choose their own personal uh, likes and dislikes, as you saw all those charts a little bit different. So, with that introduction of the rapture and Armageddon and all of that, and my true story, while well, I served as Bible Chair Director in Wilberton, Oklahoma, teaching a class, and I will always uh, be thankful for having that very religious older man who always called me Brother Bill, uh, because he had a great heart for learning the Bible. He just soaked up everything we studied concerning the life of Christ and the writings of Paul. And his story about the rapture is legendary to me. So, we got some questions. Let's run through these. Is Jesus to return in the air secretly before the rapture? And so we're going to look at these Bible verses 
And so you look at Revelation 2, 7. You are to turn to these Bible verses and answer that question. Is he going to come back secretly before the rapture? Where do we find Revelation 2, 7? 1, 7. Oh, I'm sorry. 1, 7. You're right. Man, I need to get clean my readers. Revelation 1, 7. What do we find? Every eye will see him. Oh, no secret. Not a secret at all. By the way, let me establish what I strongly feel is the correct way to interpret end of the time Bible verses. You take every Bible verse that deals with end time statements, put them all together and you have the full picture. Don't pick and choose and arrange them in some kind of linear line. What we have here is the Holy Spirit is revealing to us glimpses, pieces of the whole picture. Just put them all together and that is the picture God wants you to have. And so, here's a glimpse of it. Every eye is going to see Him. He's going to come in the clouds. Even those who pierced Him, those who crucified Him, are going to see Him. Next question. Will the church and resurrected saints be caught up for seven years before the evil are raised? Oh, by the way, the answer to the other question is no. So now we look at John 5, 28 and 29. What do we learn from that passage that can help us better understand uh, our subject of study? Everybody's going to hear his voice whether they're dead or alive. So, there's not going to be the resurrected saints at one time and the uh, evil at another time. I don't understand uh, again and again, we have the scriptures uh, talk about, as we find here, uh, when they hear his voice, everyone come out, and those who did good deeds to the resurrection of life, and those who committed bad deeds to the resurrection of judgment. Sounds just like the end of Matthew chapter 25. All of these pictures about the end time that we are to put together to have this whole picture, they all blend together. They don't conflict with each other. But again, those that want to take an obscure verse in the book of Revelation about a thousand Christ reigned for a thousand years and not see it as a figurative <coughs> verse describing the age that we now live under. They want to make it a literal thousand years in a figurative book that's full of figurative images. They enjoy picking and choosing those things they want to make literal. Now the interesting, interesting thing about the book of Revelation is that there are some literal things in that book and the book of Revelation will tell you what those things are. For instance, you'll read about a dragon. And then saying, this is the devil. This is Satan. The dragon is figurative, but Satan is literal. He is real. And that's just one example. But anyway, so you get this uh, tunnel vision. There's going to be a thousand year reign and then you add to that that and, and Christ is going to reign for a thousand years here on this earth even though there's no Bible verse that 
states he's ever going to put a toe back on this earth. And so with that tunnel vision, all these other Bible verses have they forced to be explained by creating some kind of linear timeline. Instead of putting them all together to have just one good picture of what the Holy Spirit has chosen to reveal to us. So, when Christ comes, will the earth undergo seven years of tribulation, followed by his year for a thousand years, or followed by his reign of a thousand years? Well, let's look at 2 Peter, and we're going to look at verses 8 to 13. Let me read for a while just for us. Longer passage. So the question is, when Christ comes, is the earth going to undergo seven years of tribulation followed by his reign for a thousand years? We begin, do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. And we've talked about that time doesn't exist for God. It is a created Thing for us, for our benefit. We are creatures of time. God is not. Then we find verse 9, The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Now, when you look at these great time periods where God seems to stand aside and just observe I remind you that there is no time really for God. No great. For instance, the, there's some 400 years between the Testaments from the end of Malachi to the uh, birth of Christ. There is no time to God. Those 400 years only existed here on this earth. Uh, from the time that God created this world using His Son we find in John chapter 1, all things were created by Jesus. God did it, but he's using his son to do the creating. We wonder why. Because in the Matthew 28, at the end of the chapter, we find that all authority in heaven and on earth has been placed in the hands of his son. That is the way God has chosen to do this. You might, under, might, you might wonder why. You have a holy God and you have our sinful nature. Those two cannot coexist. And so, there's a sin barrier between us and God, but God tore down that sin barrier with His Son, who was tempted in all aspects as we are, yet without sin. And with that sin barrier, with the possibility of tearing down the sin barrier that separates us from God, through the redeeming power of God's grace and mercy, through Jesus Christ, His shed blood, the opportunity for us to be buried in the likeness of His burial, raised in the likeness of His resurrection, with sins washed away, the sin barrier destroyed, knocked down, and we can have communion with God. That is why Christ is our mediator, our Savior, because of the sin problem. And then as we continue on as Christians, then we find we take, continue to take care of the sin problem as we find in 1 John 1, verse 7, 8, 9, and 10 through prayer asking for forgiveness. We say we have no sin, we're liars. And so daily Christianity involves daily prayer time, seeking to take care of our daily uh, sin problem. And if we walk in the light, our sins remain forgiven. The blood of Christ continues to cleanse us of our sin. Again, the key to that is walking in the light, as we find in 1 John uh, 1, verse 7. Now, getting back to this, we have this patient God, I will tell you, I do not understand this. And the reason I do not understand the 
phenomenal, heavenly measure of God's patience is because I'm human and I know what it is to be impatient. And so God is in control and a moment will come when he will say, that's it. He'll inform his son, send him back, boom, in the twink of an eye, and all this will be gone. Just like that. But it hadn't happened yet. We live in a very wicked, ugly, sinful world. And I'm telling you, there's nothing going on now that wasn't going on during the time of Jesus. I know that because the devil has had boundaries placed upon him. He is not able to tempt us beyond what we can endure. But I can sure tell you he's going to tempt us as much as he can. He's going to go right up to where that boundary is. Now, you might feel like me. Well, Lord, I don't know if you quite know where my boundary is sometimes. <laughs> I think it's a little uh, lower than what you might think. But he has promised me I will not be tempted beyond what I'm able to endure. And so knowing the devil or believing firmly the devil is going to push it as far as he can. We see that with Job. In other situations, he just pushes it as far as he can go till he can't go past whatever boundary that is imposed upon him. And so I feel confident that the devil pushed the boundary as far as he could um, during the time of Jesus. Look, he went after Jesus and tempted him three times with all the temptations that uh, we endure. Uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the three year, areas of all sin. All sin is either one or two or all three of those areas. And then after he hit, gave it his best shot, he then left for another opportune time. And I tell you, from what I read in Scripture, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, every time he turned, Jesus turned around, the devil was like a little nippy, yapping chihuahua chewing on the back of your heels, uh, the heel of your feet. All through his ministry on this earth, every time he turned around, there was some devil-inspired Pharisee, Sadducee, um, scribe, um, Herodian, etc., 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 that were just trying to find something to accuse him about. And he endured it all. And so if the devil's that way with Jesus, he's still that way today. They may not have had an iPhone during the uh, first century. Sin might change its form but it's still sin. So he's patient, not willing for any perish. Have you ever thought about that verse, Stein? There's a sermon there. He's not willing for anyone to perish. He wants all to be saved. That shows the loving nature of our God. But, is the next verse, verse 10, the day of the Lord come like a thief. See, there's some moment God's going to say, that's it. In which the heavens will pass away with a roar. It's not going to be silent. And the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. And earth and its works will be discovered. It's going to be known. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we're looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. <coughs> With all that in mind, again, the question, when Jesus comes, is the earth going to undergo seven years of tribulation followed by his reign for a thousand years? No, not according to this text. 
When God's patience ends, boom, it will all be over with. Again, as Scripture teaches, in the twinkling of an eye, as quick as you can blink an eye, it will all be over. Then again, when you blink your eye, that's in the arena of time. They could put a camera on your, your eye and they could tell you exactly what portion of a second it takes for your eye to blink. And that portion of a second is still the element of time. When this happens, time's not going to exist. Let's see, moving on. Will there be a thousand years between Christ's second coming and the final judgment? And this time we're going to go to 2 Timothy 1, uh, 4, verse 1. What's your answer to that question based on that text? 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. Is it coming back to this earth? For a reign of a thousand years on this earth. And then do the judgment. No. When he comes, it's going to involve the judgment of living in the dead. As we read in, a, in Matthew chapter 25, the end of the chapter. And all of this is going to happen with his appearing and he's going to have his kingdom with him because he is reigning in his kingdom right now. It exists on this earth. We are members of that kingdom. But it's also a heavenly kingdom. As Jesus told Pilate that his kingdom was not of this world. And Pilate understood what he was saying. It's always interesting to me that Pilate seemed to have a better understanding of Christ's kingdom and what he was talking about than his own apostles did. It goes right before his resurrection. They're still asking, are you going to establish the kingdom now? And he said, you just go to Jerusalem and wait. You understand. Will the good be separated from the bad long before the end of time? Well, now we're looking at Matthew 13. And we go to Matthew 13. Start at verse 47 and go to verse 50. Here we find a parable. And I've got to confess, I don't preach enough on these phenomenal, wonderful parables of Jesus. This one reads this way. Again, the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is a master of presenting kingdom parables. And here in Matthew 13, there's a parable of the pearl of great price, a parable of the hidden treasure, the parable of the weeds, uh, the parable of the uh, mustard seed and leaven, and a parable of the sower. Just good, good stuff in this wonderful chapter of parables. But anyway, the parable of the net. The kingdom of heaven is like, and you, we are in that kingdom, like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. I viewed some of these pictures of uh, these fishing boats and their nets and stuff, and uh, there's a lot of laws that govern nets on fishing boats. There's got to be an escape hatch for certain uh, aquatic animals like porpoises and dolphins that they can escape through a hole or something in the top of the net because they're smart enough to do that while the other uh, swarm of the fish uh, are caught in the net. And then they bring that net out and they dump it on top of the boat and immediately they're going through the fish, separating what they are fishing for and casting the rest out. They don't want any squid or octopuses or 
Anything else they might grab a hold of, there's certain kind of fish that they certainly don't want. And so, uh, so there's always this kind of separation whenever you gather fish. And here it sounds like when uh, Jesus told Peter, put down your nets again, in verse 48, and when it was filled, they pulled it up on the beach, and they sat down and gathered the good fish in the containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and remove the wicked from among the righteous. Again, it sounds like the end of Matthew 25. And they will throw them to the furnace of fire in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Which sounds like what parable? If it is a parable. What Bible story? Does Matthew 13, 50 bring to mind? story. Huh? Rich man Lazarus. Where the rich, the rich man found himself to be in Hades. He was in torment. Was, I'm in pain in this fire. He wanted just a drop of water on his tongue. The word judgment is probably a poor English word, or at least our definition of judgment, is probably a poor word for us to understand judgment. Judgment in Scripture is a day of eternal sentencing. It's not making the decision. Once we've lived our life, that decision is, we've set our course. The judgment is not, hmm, what am I going to do with you? What should I do with you? Hmm, you see, you did, did this that day, but then you were this way, that other day. No, that's not what we're finding. Instead, what we find, the judgment is a day, uh, a moment of separating an eternity beginning for both the righteous and the unrighteous. Bill? Yes, yes. One thing I've noticed over the years, talking about the rapture and stuff, people will not, people study the Bible in a different way than they study other things. In other words, if you had a book that led to a, a, buried, a buried treasure and they had to, you had to read the whole book to find out all the clues, mm -hmm. well, they would just read it and jot them down. They would find every clue and they'd go find the treasure. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be given in a, in a simple sentence here and the same sentence here and the same sentence here and the same sentence here. It's just like the Bible. And just like you were saying, everything it's it's Jesus doesn't the apostles when they say that he who believes will be saved, he doesn't they don't go through baptism every time. You have to glean it. But people for some reason will study another book or another research something else totally different from the way they researched the Bible. I don't quite understand that. Yeah. Uh, why does God not in Matthew 1, 1 say, for you to go to heaven, for you to be saved, do X, Y, Z. And just list them right there. There's, there's a phenomenon, culture thing right uh -huh. now among the kids in 20 somethings called escape rooms. Where, and you can do them in your classroom, you can actually go to buildings and do them, and basically you are given a whole series of clues, step one, step two, step three, step four. And until you unlock every one of those puzzles, you and your group cannot escape. Mm -hmm. So that, Gene, that's a great illustration that would <coughs> totally be understood by kids and young adults right now who participate. I've never heard that comparison before, but that yeah. that's exactly that's exactly right. And if you can you can and that's just a, a great set of words to use with people like that. I've heard they of get, some, they get that. They understand. This yeah. is your escape room. This is you have to find all of this. I've I've heard of some people attending an escape room event. Unfortunately, in all these escape rooms, usually there's a time limit, a lot of them. So, I mean, you're not there for, for a week or so locked in this room at some or point. For a lifetime. 
Huh? Or a lifetime. Or a lifetime. They're going to let you out. If you totally fail in figuring out the clues. Maybe we don't have the sense of urgency that maybe the first century church didn't have. With Roman time. persecution, they had a real sense of, you know, it's, it's of very, urgency. It's very different for us. Yeah. Brother Bill? <laughs> I've got a question for you. Okay. <laughs> Since our time is about Go right time. ahead, Brother Center. <laughs> Brother Gene. Should we lead songs that have the rapture word in them? A lot of our songs in our songbooks say rapture in them. Should we lead those songs? The word rapture, there's nothing wrong with the word rapture. It just means a, 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 a great excitement. And so the word rapture used in those songs are not talking about this false religious world concept of a rapture. And so you, you read those songs very closely, and it's just using the word rapture as a great moment. Of excitement and and reward. Now that's my understanding. Just thinking of a few songs that had the word rapture. Not the songs I, I I know of are not talking about this denominational view of a rapture. So anyway, again, will the good be separate from the bad long for the end time? No. All right. We got another no question, but I'm out of time. And so we've made good progress. And so maybe we can even finish the second half of this lesson this next week. And so for those of you on our live stream, we thank you for being with us. And I hope you'll join us next week. And we will continue at this spot uh, working on this good lesson. And I appreciate so very much everyone's comments and again if you're wanting more information I can fulfill your wish and so see me uh, after services or contact me if you're on a live stream and I will provide additional information about the world's teachings concerning the rapture and Armageddon and it's their false teachings and so we're going to end this live stream and those of you in our live stream, please join right back.